This is Mr. Benji's ADD Experience Live, doing the radio format thing on this AMP platform by Amazon for the second time. Actually, it's not for the second time. I did a few test runs before this, but this is the second time I'm posting it up. I'm being scheduled and I'm doing things. Listen, this is a new format, new platform. We're trying things out. We're getting the format ready. We're going to be talking about some Apple design. We're going to be talking about the Apple Vision Pro, what it means, what it means for designers, what it means for humanity, because what is design without humanity involved? So listen, if you got any comments, questions, or anything like that, let me know. If you have any facts, I don't have all the facts. So if you have any facts, be sure to throw them up in the chat. Let me know what's happening. And thank you all for showing up, even though I'm two minutes late, three minutes late. Because you know what? As I said, new format, doing the morning, midday talk show kind of action. And we'll see how it goes from there. But first of all, I want to jump into some audio hits to let everybody settle in for a little bit. And you know what? This Apple, this is the new future. I feel things coming. And so I'm going to send this one out from Daft Punk and The Weeknd. I feel it coming. This is a song used by Apple in some of their promotional materials for the Beats and for the iPod. So Apple's all in bed with these guys. And guess what? I feel it coming. And definitely much love to Gypsy Love coming through and showing love. Hey, this new platform is fun, man. I am digging this. I used to just run my podcast straight off of the recordings. And I uh, used to try, try Instagram Live, YouTube Live, Facebook Live. And th those are all valid platforms, right? But I like this AMP thing because it's a little more of a radio vibe. And I think radio is a little more suited to community. You get on these lives and it seems more like a webinar or some guy holding a lecture for people. And as much as the comments are great, it doesn't feel like community unless you've got a huge number of people. But with this radio platform, I'm digging it. So that's why I'm here and I'm going to be talking topics every morning. And I've realized something as I was designing this. And we're not just going to talk about Apple design today, but design in general. This is, it's, it's interesting to see how a platform and the people and the emotion and the, the view behind a platform and its design and its setup and its structure it's interesting to see how that informs actually how the content plays out. Because with AMP, TikTok, and Clubhouse, whatever platform you're talking about, even Snapchat's over there doing new things, that has got its dedicated community. It's always interesting to see how design plays out. Now with Apple stepping into the space, because Apple really hasn't been in the, I mean, they've been in their own little bubble for a while, but since the iPhone, we haven't really seen a big shift in Apple's presence, right? I mean, it was the iPod, the, if you want to take it back, let's take it back. They came through with the mouse, the graphical user interface. They really pushed that. Shout out to Xerox, who they kind of stole it from. The iPod, then you had the iPhone, and people were talking about tablet computing being dead. Apple came through and reinvigorated the entire market with the iPad. I mean, say what you want about whether it's actually a technical innovation or not, they were able to bring the community, the emotion, the, the eyeballs to it. And is it a cult? Sure. There's a lot of, there's a lot of cultishness to it, but they get the job done and that's what design requires. So my question is, and don't, don't fold said, said curious, just curious about the whole thing. Exactly. There are some angles on this Apple product that are, that are interesting, that are not quite together yet. and I don't know that anyone's actually saying it. I haven't heard any of the podcast or news reports say it, but this design does seem to be missing some of Steve Jobs' magic. We'll definitely get into that in a little bit. And if you're a current Apple user or not an Apple user, I figure a lot of Apple people will jump in here in some form or fashion. And don't worry, Apple people still have plenty of, of shade to throw at Apple itself, especially with a $3,500 price tag. Shout out Real Theo Harvey for reminding me of that one. It's going to get interesting, but before it gets too interesting, uh, I'm going to go into a little bit of lose yourself because you're going to be in these, you're going to be in these 3D VR, AR streets. You might be losing yourself a little bit. And a lot of people are concerned about that going into the future with all, all these designs. How are we staying connected as humans? Do we need VR and AR? Why this? Why Apple? Why now? So don't lose yourself. Speaking of losing yourself, man, I'm about to, they losing me on some of this technical stuff, but 
I got to admit, AMP is actually updating their app and Amazon seems to be on top of it. Hey, man, I know a lot of y'all out in these digital streets, these AI slums, hanging out in these uh, VR venues, not really living life. Hey, I don't know, but um, it's interesting with this whole VR thing. And Apple is pushing it, man. They're going big. I mean, if you're Apple, you got to go big or go home, right? So that's what we're going to get into. So if you're not up to speed, let me just run through some of the facts. We'll talk a little bit about some of the interesting things that we saw. Let me know what stuck out to you, what didn't, if you saw it, if you missed it, or if you didn't even know it was coming. So here are the details. This came from Apple's World Developer Conference. This thing shows up every year. They usually talk about something exciting for Apple users mostly, where you've got a new, you've got a new M1 chip or something. You've got a new, a new OS where you can do cool things like look at a transparent background of some mountain somewhere. They, that's the kind of stuff they usually do. And everybody understands you're just continuing along and moving forward at a regular pace. This was a groundbreaking one, because as I said before, you've got this big jump into a new era, a big push, and Apple makes a big statement. As I said, biggest thing since the, since the iPhone. So where are they going with this? What are they going to do? Well, first of all, let's just run down some of the facts. First of all, interesting fact is it's $3,500. They made sure not to mention this very much, but it's the buzz that's getting around. So I'm going to lead off with it. When you have release a product that's the greatest thing ever, people shouldn't be talking about, hey, you heard about Apple's new $3,500 product? That's, that might not be the best thing to lead off with, the fact that it costs that much. And what's happening, uh, Kaleo 184 good to see you coming through. Thanks for stopping by, showing love in the, in the room. Yeah, so you got a $3,500 product, and that's leading off. Even, even when the Neo Geo came out back in the day, and that was a really expensive product for its time, I believe they were running at like $700 if you could get a deal on a Neo Geo console. And even then, people were saying, hey, man, I can play all my favorite games. I can play Samurai Showdown. I can play Magician Lord. I can play, I forgot, Gunmetal. I can play that. And they were all happy about it. But then somebody would come in the conversation and say, well, yeah, but it's, it's really expensive. I mean, this is leading off the conversation, which is funny to me. So I don't know what that means. It's going to, it's interesting play. Um, and by the way, they, they called it the Vision Pro. So if they're calling $3,500 the Pro, I think what they're doing is taking the high price strategy and they'll say, hey, this is the Vision Pro, $3,500. But then they come out with the, the regular or the SE version or whatever you want to call it. And then they'll have, hey, you know, it's not $3,500 for the average person. It's going to be maybe $2,500 for the regular version. And you, you've seen them do that with iPhones and iPads in the past as well. So. But leading off with that, I think they're trying to soften the blow of the price, which is a pretty slick move. And I'll, in the comments, let me know if you're thinking about VR and let me know what you're thinking about the future of this, because that's what I'm going to jump into in the next segment. But let me continue with the facts. It uses mixed reality. So everybody's been talking about virtual reality and getting totally lost in this world. But what you have here is mixed reality. And I'll explain what that is in a second. So with virtual reality, you have this idea of going into a complete virtual world where your audio and your visual is shut off. You're imagining yourself in this new universe. And that's what you got with the Meta Quest by, by Facebook, Facebook company Meta. Zuckerberg was, has been pushing that. And that's a lot cheaper. I think they have models out for $299, I believe, and $399. So you get that at that lower price point. This is like 10 times the price of that, right? But it's totally virtual reality. It's, it's, it keeps you locked in the space. So what is augmented reality then? Augmented reality is taking a current look at your, your universe as it exists and then adding on virtual elements on top of that. If you've played something like Pokemon Go, you've seen augmented reality. If you've seen something like Amazon's product, I forgot what they call it, but there's, there's an application where if you want to see what a product looks like in your home, you can actually use augmented reality to look through the phone and see what that product would look like sitting on your shelf, sitting on the floor, sitting in your driveway or whatever. So that's augmented reality where it takes the current reality and layers on 
virtual elements on top of it. Now, if you have something called a mixed reality, that's what Apple's bringing to the floor. They're bringing mixed reality. And this means that they can totally immerse you or cut off experiences as, as, as they feel necessary for the design of the application. Or they can show you the world as it exists and just put elements on top of it. They really didn't explain that too well because I think they're trying to stay away from the terms everybody else has been doing and using. But this is definitely a mixed reality format. And, okay, this thing's telling me I'm low on space. Man, screw you. I'm going to delete some files and we will be okay because we're going to keep recording. But yeah, mixed reality. You're able to totally close off the space as well as show it certain elements in the space. So let's say you're, you've got your virtual reality 3D space and you're watching a three-dimensional movie or something and everything's coming at you from all different directions. You can't see anything. You can't hear anything. But imagine your mom walks in the room or your husband, your wife walks in the room and they start talking to you. Maybe this mixed reality system allows them to pierce the space. It allows them to show up. And the cameras know to, oh, that's a person coming into the room. Let's make sure I show that person in the space and still keep everything else out. Or maybe it auto pauses, right? Or something like that. That's something you can do with a mixed reality space. And it honestly starts reminding me of the holodeck experience. So if you think back to Star Trek, they had this thing called the holodeck. And if you're following me as an next game developer and a tech guy, I don't know how you wouldn't know about the Star Trek holodeck, but it was this idea that you could go into this room and just to start describing everything around you and it could make this virtual space. But you, the things you brought into the space were still visible and still active. So that's a way of using a mixed reality space. So, and there was no talk, interestingly, of a quote unquote metaverse. They probably didn't want to give Zuckerberg and, and his whole operation any, any props, any, any new shine or, or, or thought, but you can, that meta is definitely in their minds when they're doing this. Hey man, anytime virtual reality comes up, <laughs> real Theo Harvey's giving me some heat in the, in the comments. Yeah. We're talking about Star Trek and no, I do not consider myself. It, in NERD, especially not in all caps, <laughs> but, but I will talk about it as necessary. Shout out to Comic-Con and the Star Trek crowd that I ended up meeting there. Shout out to <laughs> hot nerd girl, Tracy and, and Andy from the Chinese pirate. Anyway, all my friends in the community love you. So yeah, so there was no talk of the metaverse, right? And the metaverse is this concept where you go into a new virtual space and it's a completely different universe and world from your current world. And you just kind of live in there. You play out scenarios. Maybe you're gaming, you're racing, you're just hanging out with friends, talking or whatever. Maybe all your friends are together in this 3D space doing a, some type of virtual escape room or something. I don't know. That's the metaverse. They didn't want to touch that area in this promotion. They didn't go there. And it seemed like an easy layup to start talking about metaverse. And what this makes me question is with Apple is one, do they want to go there? And two, did they have anything ready to start, to start pushing in that direction? And I honestly don't think they did this as slick as this presentation was, it actually felt a little, I don't want to say rushed, but it felt like they were really pushing to get in what they did and still maintain their Apple slickness. And you can almost tell by the people who are presenting, right? All the people who are presenting sounded a little stilted, a little, a little formulaic. It's not like they were very experienced with this product and could just talk off the riff. It looked like they were, they had memorized the teleprompter basically. And Hey, this is the thing I'm supposed to say right now. I'm going to say it. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be the future. I think when Apple is really into their products and they really have a grasp on where they're going, I think they're a little more, a little more confident. They're a little more free flowing. They're a little more, dare I say, exciting, right? seems like something dropped out for a little bit. Anyway, I don't know how much of that is speculation or how much of that is just actual stuff going on behind the scenes. That tends to happen sometime in these corporate environments, but We'll, uh, we'll, we'll keep going. So yeah, the, 
the metaverse is a big thing. And I want, I want to explain a little bit about the metaverse. A lot of people get that confused with a completely virtual world where you just go in and you disappear into a, a universe. That's not technically what the metaverse is. I think the company Meta started pushing that as their description of the metaverse so they could, they could own a chunk of this digital real estate and brand it as their own. But any connection you have digitally, anything you're doing in a virtual space. And you, I could even take that to sending out postcards and newsletters. Basically, you live in a current universe, but these digital and virtual connections you start to make start to create this new universe, this new way of living, this new community, this new layer on top of our current universe. And I say layer intentionally because it's a layer, meta, it's a little bit above, it's a little bit on top of, it's a little bit of a coding to the current universe we have. And you end up with this concept called a metaverse where, you know, you see kids running around and you're like, what's going on with those kids? And you think absolutely nothing. No, they're in their own little metaverse. They've got their own connections. They've got their own communities. They've got their own chat rooms. They've got their own ways of communicating. And they're starting to live in a, their own separate little universes, their own little bubbles. So when you start talking about a metaverse, it's this new community layer society that we're building on top of our current universe. It has its own rules, it has its own health concerns, it has its own policing, et cetera, et cetera. But Apple spoke of none of that. Apple kind of sidestepped it. Maybe that's too much of a future talk. A lot of people are pushing back on it, actually, since the, the pandemic's winding down, obviously, and people are back, back to doing things in real life. Companies are pushing for going back to work and not working remote anymore. Maybe there's a little bit of pushback to the actual idea of a metaverse. But I thought that was another interesting take from what we see them doing. And I'll get into the big three in a second. If you don't know the big three, are, I'll explain it to you. But yeah, mixed reality, you can definitely see around your world. And you can see someone's eyes if they're looking at you from the outside. That's actually an interesting and slick move by Apple. And I'm sure it didn't take, it, it wasn't a trivial thing to put someone's eyes on the outside of the goggles. But now, whenever I look at these goggles, and I'm calling them goggles because you can see through them, I mean, virtually see through them on both ends, right? Because for all these other VR headsets that you've seen since the beginning of time, you haven't been able to see the person's eyes. And that pulls away from the humanity a little bit. So I imagine Apple said, this is one of those must-have things that we have to do. We have to get in there and show the players, I mean, the player, the user's eyes. That's that bit of humanity may be the thing that really takes it to that next level. It's one of those things that only Apple would probably lead off with. Some other companies might do it and it'd probably seem corny and they'd start, hey, look, we can give you anime eyes and we can give you robot eyes or sad eyes or whatever. And they'd probably do it corny. But Apple was just playing it straight. Like, look, we're going to show pictures of your eyes so you're a little more connected, even though you're disconnected. Mixed reality once again. Also, this thing has 12 different cameras to it, right? 12 different cameras. And there's a reason for that. First of all, you can take photos in 3D. So imagine walking around just taking 3D imagery of everything you see around you. There are a lot of different applications for this that I liked. And not just taking 3D pictures of your kids, but if you start talking about recreating three-dimensional spaces, a house contractor goes into an empty workspace or a skeleton of a, of a building and just kind of looks around and surveys the area, they could immediately start building out 3D, 3D information and somebody offsite could start populating that area with, with furniture, with fixtures, plumbing, electric, the electric wiring. A lot of interesting applications that can be brought up just by being able to have 12 different cameras looking around. I mean, the iPhone had three cameras on it. People thought it was goofy. Look, we're going to take this up to 12. We're going to 4X this B. Real Theo Harvey said, I thought the god-awful headset took away from the person to humanity. I mean, it's a headset, but it doesn't make you look as alien as the Meta Quest or any of these other headsets. The Snapchat goggles, glasses that were used for AR, they were kind of like these old school Ray-Bans that just looked like you were kind of goofy. So... Does it take away? Yes, but it's 
as far as VR goes and that fully immersive, fully immersive situation, fully immersive way of looking at things, I think they did the best or Apple has done the best at capturing that. And they still got a long way to go because even, even as much as people were talking about it, reports are coming back that, yeah, it's comfortable, but it's still a headset. So you're definitely right there. It's still a little heavy. And I'm, I'm sure that's why they took the battery out of the headset and made it separate. I, I assure you that caused many arguments in, in the design area where it's like, we're going to, we're going to build batteries in the headset. Got to be built in the headset. And some other person from the engineering team stands up and it's like, you're full of shit. We're going to do it this way. And we're not going to have the headset headset contain the battery. What if it blows up? You could burn the guy's head. And ah, you know, there are probably arguments all over the place. I hope it doesn't blow up, but it's a nice little battery pack that they've got attached to it. We'll see how that plays out. I expect the technology to get better and improve and we'll lose that at some point. But in the meantime, we've got the battery pack. And speaking of the battery pack, it only rocks for two hours. So if you're sitting there watching a an immersive movie, it better not be Avengers Endgame because it's going to go over two hours. So you can control your level of immersion also. So if you're watching a movie, you can kind of, speaking back to being connected with the area around you, you have a way of closing out the world or showing more of the world. It's like this little slider switch they have where you can turn the world up or turn the world down and or turn the virtualness up and turn the virtualness down just by moving a little knob and that's the slick little thing for movies or presentations or whatever you might be doing so that's cool all right we talked about the battery pack and there's oh they also mentioned a slight business application like when you're facetiming you basically take this thing off and take a picture of yourself a 3d picture and suddenly you've got an avatar now what they didn't do with this avatar like Meta did with their presentation, they didn't make it some cartoony version of you. They said, no, you're going to take a 3D picture of you and we're going to use that as your avatar. It looks like it's only capturing the bust for right now. So it seems like you'll be able to take off the headset or hold it at arm's length and it will capture enough of your torso and chest and head to get the information that it needs. And then that'll be your avatar. You can talk with that. You can look around. You could probably be in some chat rooms with that. I think that's really interesting. It, it, it will move towards that, that remote. I mean, as much as they're trying to pull away from remote work in certain ways, this was a kind of push toward, well, for people who are working remotely, maybe we just want to show a, a floating bust that uses machine learning to figure out how you should look in a, in a three-dimensional little window of yourself, three-dimensional profile image of you. I was kind of hoping that we'd be able to see those little the Apple emojis, what do they call me emojis? I was hoping you'd be able to see some sort of me emoji in 3D space, but that may have taken away a little bit from the vibe of the presentation. So that's that. All right, what else we got? They said they have a, they have this new term called audio ray tracing. So in in their discussion, they called this spatial computing, and this is interesting because they're trying to pull away from this idea of a flat screen and. But the term spatial computing, we're talking about spatial, it's it's in dealing with the three-dimensional space and you existing in a certain point in the world, where it's not just you on a computer or the computer defines where you are. You are in a 3D space and living. Now you've got computing that interacts in that space. And the first thing this made me think of was Minority Report. If you haven't seen the movie Minority Report, it's the movie that made popular the idea of spatial computing where you're not tied down to a, a monitor or a screen that you hold in your hand or something that's just in your ear. You actually walk around the space and you throw up a window and start tapping buttons in the air. You start inter interacting with things in this virtual space, like in like as if all your windows were just floating around you. Any of you have seen Iron Man, obviously you've seen the whole, the way Tony Stark throws around images and he interacts with Jarvis in a very hand hand motion kind of way. I was about to say a sign language kind of way, but I don't want to confuse this with ASL. But, you know, you're moving around and you're using gestures to control the 3D space. That is very interesting. And this technology is not new. A lot of the Microsoft Connect fans are going to be up in arms talking about, dude, we were doing this back in the 2000s. Yeah, it was great technology. It was fun. The nerd engineering 
3D camera recognition community loved it. Nobody else did. It was too early. I really loved it, thought it was cool. But now Apple's head, headset and their 12 cameras are going to be able to watch your hand movements, your arm gestures, your head gestures, and be able to create a new way of interacting with things. Knowing Apple, it'll be slick or not slick at all. There is kind of no in-between. It'll kind of be a little wonky or it'll be smooth. I mean, they, they use the example of pinching your fingers to make a window bigger, but that's not what people want to see. They want to, they want to be able to just take a file and ball up their hands and like throw it in the trash can. Actually, that would be pretty cool if you could just ball up, take a file, ball it up in your hands and then use the basketball throw to see if you can make it into a trash can. That would actually be pretty fun. And that's one of those goofy things that would actually get people talking. Apple, if you like that idea, no need to no need to send me anything. Just give me a little more iCloud credit. All right. So, yeah, the 3D controls, that's actually pretty interesting. And once again, though, it still didn't touch on the big three, which I will get to in a second. Most iconic screen plus iPhone, screen plus window. Oh, and no controllers. One big jump forward with being able to use your hands is you don't have to worry about controllers. So you don't have to worry about keypads and you don't have to worry about thumb joysticks and virtual hand controllers. You just use your hands. Obviously, that's much more natural. Where does that get us? Where does that lead us? It leads us to the future because ultimately at some point, I just want to start doing crazy hand gestures in the middle of my house and Alexa, Siri, Cortana, whoever you want to talk to, your uh, your virtual chat GPT bot or whatever. I just want to start doing hand gestures and have my house respond. I want to have my virtual home respond. I want to have the game respond. I want to have uh, Pornhub VR respond, whatever you're using it for. I want to have my, if I need to, call 911 without actually saying anything, just some crazy hand gestures or whatever that might call 911. It could be an actual thing. So that's what we're going to get into. And if you didn't realize there at the end of this, I hinted at the big three. And I think we're going to talk about the big three after we come back from break. But for right now, Apple's doing this thing. Are they going to be the ones who keep us together? Oh, I, t I always took pride in being connected to music. I don't know if I've told you, a lot of you this before, but I grew up in a very music rich household. My father listened to old jazz and old blues. My mother listened to opera and classical music. My brother, my, my oldest brother listened to a lot of DJ tunes and a lot of scratching and stuff that was at New York sounding, Eric B. Rakim and all that. My, my brother next to him, he listened to a lot of more like the MTV jams, the Belle Bib DeVoe, and some down south hits. We turned me on to the southern music. One of my sisters was into Cindy Lauper and the pop music scene and all of that. I, like, I didn't know who Phil Collins was. And she's like, no, you got to check this out. There's this group Genesis. It's awesome. It's, it's great. And I'm like, okay, sure, I'll check it out. And uh, my other sister was into a lot of the R&B and the slower stuff. Mary J. Blige, she put me on to a lot of old school crooners and singers like that. So I grew up with a lot of this music in my house. And uh, oh yeah, I'm the Cindy Lauper sister also put me on a lot of rock music too. I just, I just, it just wasn't part of my thing until you, you're, it's not part of your thing until you see somebody jamming out to a certain style of music. So that's one thing I'm really glad that AMP is around for because I can do this type of music integration with just sitting here talking. Because if anything, music is the language of emotion. I said I was going to get into the next part of this that's not so Apple-based, but a little more about the future of things. Shout out to Cam in the comments. Cam says, I just hope implementing this type of tech doesn't disrupt true human connection even further, like the new N95 mask with bells and whistles. Ooh. I hear what you're going for, Cam, and maybe I shouldn't have mentioned the N95 mask because now I'm going to be on some some algorithms list of people who talked about the untalkaboutable. I don't know if you, if you guys use Instagram or not, by the way, you can jump on Instagram and follow me there where I post a lot of, a lot of other stuff and more in a more wide, wide ranging kind of thing I post on Instagram. But if you want to follow me there, check me out there too. But yeah, if you're on Instagram, you notice very quickly that 
if you say something that goes against the 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 mask or pandemic or anything like that or you start leaning in that direction they'll not just put up warnings sometimes they'll they'll lower the amount of views you get i don't want to say i don't want to say a full on shadow ban because sometimes yet that's just you screwing up and messing up the algorithm so most people misuse the word shadow ban but you're definitely your influence and reach is definitely lessened when you start saying a lot of things that they don't like and you don't even have to say it in verbally because we know they're transcribing what you say and they're looking through your text not just in the comments but even in the pictures that you use so if you use a picture that says something they're connecting you. i mean they're they're looking at you i don't know how much of that you caught but that's exactly what happens when you start talking about things you shouldn't be talking about out in these internet streets alexa uh, I apologize. Uh, <laughs> connection went bad when I started talking about that. Cam, you're going to get me caught up in these chats. You're going to get me caught up in these internet streets. I don't believe it. The algorithm disrupted me. Oh, man. No, I think they... Re that's, that's real talk, Theo Harvey. They just got me. They got me talking that noise, and uh, I went a little too conspiratorial and got, got etched. If you don't think... I mean... We could talk about it, laugh about it, but there is a certain amount of this stuff that happens. If you look at it at a very simple technological level, you've got a big stream of data that's coming through, just this huge, huge, massive amounts of data. And what these programmers are looking for is something called markers. And markers are things that mark you as a certain liability, a certain threat, a certain problem. They don't know what it is, but they've got markers that they're looking for when they're just plowing through tons and tons of data. Imagine flipping through, imagine flipping through a huge book, right? And your eyes are, your eyes are trained to look for certain words. And all of a sudden, once you start seeing enough of these words all at once, then you're like, okay, I see these, these couple keywords. I need to stop, take a moment and look at the actual data on that page. Or what did I just pass by? I mean, you guys have done this when you're flipping through books and you're looking for something. This is what the data stream is doing. It's looking for certain keywords, certain markers. If it finds enough of these markers, it actually has to stop for a second, pull you to the side, investigate you, just like the police would do if they were pulling you over. They actually pull you to the side and start going through your data, seeing if everything's okay, all because you matched up with their markers. And if everything seems okay, they send you on your way. If it doesn't seem okay, then you get graduated to another supervisor. You get sent to that person's manager or something. And this is the way computers are doing it. So certain things get marked in their system. Somebody may have to take a quick glance at it or another computing system may have to take a second look at what you're doing to make sure you're on the level. Because what they're scared of is any liability. They're just, just business-wise, they're scared of any type of liability. So... I know you've probably seen the stuff that goes on on lives nowadays where something got yanked immediately. And they're like, how did they yank that so quickly? Was somebody sitting there watching it? Maybe. Or they were watching the markers. And as you were doing it, your face showed up on some, some kid's computer screen in Indonesia. And when I say kid in Indonesia, I mean like a, they have computing farms basically out in these countries like Indonesia, Pakistan, the Philippines. Well, I won't say Ukraine because I'm not sure how big that operation is over there. But they have all, uh, Yugoslavia, a lot of these little countries, they have these computing farms. And if something gets interesting, some kid from another country is supposed to say whether it's good or bad. It's supposed to have a human person looking at the screen or looking at the feed saying, is it good or bad? And then they throw a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And a lot of these people in these communities don't have context. So if I say, if I say something referring to a certain color and I'm talking about the visual color and this kid in Indonesia doesn't understand my context and he thinks I'm talking about racial matters, he may just throw a thumbs down and next thing you know, I may have a 30 second pause on my show and that, that may not kick me off, that may not get me booted, 
but it may just be a thing. So, I mean, there, there are all kinds of ways this stuff happens, but it actually happens. Instagram has flagged a couple of my pictures because I like to play around in the, the innuendo and the insinuation area without actually saying straight out. So I like to play in that little artsy area where you're just getting people to think. And that's been enough to get a lot of my posts pulled and get a lot of things flagged. So yeah, long way of saying that something's out there. Shout out to X-Files. I should have put some X-Files music in my playlist. Maybe I'll do that later. <laughs> but it's all good. It's all good. I, as I said, I'm definitely recording this offline. So I have a recording way, a way of recording this from AMP. So it's not just AMP that I'm recording through. I also have a separate offline recording. So that's what I end up editing, chopping up without the music. And I send it off to the podcast streams. So check me out on YouTube. Check me out on your favorite podcast player. And if I should get booted from AMP for whatever reason, um, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I love you, Amazon. I think Alexa is cute. And uh, even if Alexa is a little bloated right now, I'm all for body positivity and I'm from Florida. So I like them thick. Shout out to Alexa. Anyway, back to what I was talking about a while ago. Apple stock is at an all time high, right? So leading off from Apple and people being impressed about the way that technology is moving forward. Leading up to this conference that Apple did, Apple stock hit an all time high. Now, I mean, we're, we're nearing a $3 trillion market evaluation. It could be the first company to get that high on the stock charts, which is crazy. So you got to wonder, what is Apple doing out there that's, that's worth all this money? And they're trailblazing. And they're keeping a very closed, closed community, a closed economic system. And if they can push this product, along with all their other products, into, into the world consciousness, I think a lot of people find value in pushing these technologies. Now, on its face, I am a technological person. I am in, of, of an engineering and coding mind, and I do appreciate all this technology. But when I first got into this technology game, when I first got into programming on my Commodore VIC-20, which used a, a tape drive, like a literal cassette tape drive, I was able to save and write and read to a cassette tape. That's how crazy it was back in the day. Back in that time, I was, I was coding on my little computer, getting into it. And the first thing I thought of is, wow, this type of technology, this type of thought could bring humans closer together. We could communicate. We could get around a computer and have fun. All of my friends were interested in connecting and utilizing technology and enhancing our lives. But you also have outside forces. You have things coming in from the financial world, the military world, the, the, the vice world. And I mean, any of your vices where people just want to sell you things to pull your mind away from humanity. And that's, that's a dangerous area. And I think that's where a lot of concerns with this push to humanize Apple and humanize all these corporate innovations. I think that's where the difficulty really lies because how do you push technology far and fast without losing your humanity? I, I don't have the answers to that. But as a game developer, I've always hoped that we can get to a place where the computers and the connections are secondary to the human connection. They're secondary to us vibing together as people. Shout out to Shakti Carmen in the comments. Nice to see you. Glad having you back. Always a happy Wednesday. Thanks for the good vibes. So yeah, it was always a human thing for me. And I know a lot of people who may have known me coming up may have thought I was off to myself. I was definitely an introvert, not shy. I had no problem speaking on stage or talking to people, but I just didn't want to. I thought a lot of what people around me were saying was just kind of nonsense. So I was like, yeah, you can stop talking right now. Let's go outside and play basketball or let's go to the library and hang out or whatever. But most of what you're talking about was nonsense. So that's what I came up with. And this was in North Florida, South Georgia. So 
that's you don't think of North Florida, South Georgia as a technological mecca. So I was just kind of on my own in that in that sense, in that regard. So, yes, I, I was and still am an introvert, but I am all about people connecting in the way they can. People getting together with groups of friends and family and connecting and technology can help that. But it's always upon us to say, you know what, I'd like to connect more with people. In fact, I don't know if you guys remember, but Netflix used to have, and Amazon still has it, but Netflix used to push this thing called the watch party. And for some reason, they never pushed that. And I'm like, why wouldn't you push this idea of a watch party? Why would you hold the watch party back from people? And the watch party was a way to connect over the internet with other people you knew and watch something together. It seems like that'd be a that'd be a big thing to connect, be a big thing to use and a big thing to promote. But nevertheless, people weren't really digging it like that. Um, and when I say people, I mean the companies weren't really pushing it like that, which was always a surprise to me. Try to push more humanity and you say, well, the people don't want it. It's like, you know what? Uh, the people don't quote unquote want a lot of things, but if it's good for the people, you might need to push it out there. If people are dying of hydration, you can sell them Coca-Cola or you can sell them water. You could, you could also keep pushing water out there, even if it's free, add more water fountains, add more free water bottles, do things like that. But somehow we've gotten to this place where we charge more for water than we do for soda. So there's a financial bend behind it. But anyway. Let me not get back into that side of the conspiratorial things. Carrying on. So yeah, Apple stock's at an all-time high. And it doesn't hit on the big three. Now, I mentioned the big three earlier in the show, and I'm going to come back to it now. You've got this concept called the big three. And it's basically that when you come out with the technology, when you come out with the new platform, it's got to be able to hit three different markets or it should hit three different markets before you know that it's really going to go into the mainstream. And if you know those three markets, props. If you don't, listen up. The first one is porn. If you have a new technology and you can't get your rocks off with it, then you've got a problem. And I know it sounds gross, it sounds crass, that technology is intimately intertwined with porn, but that's kind of just how it is. When, when people were first able to take pictures and send photographs around, one of the first things people said was, hey, you got any pictures of, uh, you know, hmm, that? You got any pictures of that? Boom, there was a whole market for it. Internet came around. When I was first getting onto the CompuServe message boards, People are like, hey, click here. I'm gonna show you some, I'm gonna show you some bits you've never seen before. And I'm like, what? A teenage, teenage boy on the on the forums. I was like, what is this guy talking about? What happens if I click here? Boom. Oh my God. I'd never seen that before in my entire life. And it's a whole, it's a whole thing, right? People wonder how these sites make money. They make money. So that's the first of the big three. Second of the big three for technology. And it's not, a, I'm not like pushing a right or wrong thing. It's just that you're going to see this, these big three factors pushing through a technology if the technology is worth its weight. The second of the big three is going to be games, entertainment. You can't really get a new technology adopted unless there's some entertainment aspect to it. Because for whatever reason, if people don't think they can have fun with something or people don't think they can enjoy it on a very basic human level, then they're just not going to rock with it. So back to like the printing press or, I mean, you can, you can consider, you can consider prawn a form of entertainment, but that's, it's, it's separate. You know what I mean? When you're talking about mainstream entertainment of just having fun versus prawns. So, so regular entertainment games, if you can make a technology and you can play games on it, whether it's tic-tac-toe, people were playing Space Invaders over, over the internet. People were playing Doom was one of the big ones that came out. What are we going to do with this 3D technology? And it's like, hey, look, I got this video game called Doom and I got this video game called Wolfenstein. 
And I was like, holy crap, I'm into it. And boom, all of a sudden the market became a thing. People were buying new computers, computers that nobody in the regular public market were thinking about buying until Doom and Wolfenstein 3D pushed the, pushed the envelope. People were saying, look, I don't care what you say. I got to hook up an entire Ethernet system. I got to hook up an entire new modem. I got to hook up an entire new monitor just so I could play Doom and I could be invested in this game. I got to go outside and dig up some wires so I can connect faster, so I can get a fiber optic connection so I can play Doom. And I got kicked out of my computer lab in, in college for, for hooking up video games. I got, eventually got, actually, I got kicked out of the labs twice. And when I say kicked out, I don't mean asked to leave. I mean, they wrote it down that your login is no longer available at this lab because you introduced gaming. And I'm like, look, I got things to do. I'm going into games. It's part of my job. It's part of my vibe. It's part of my thing. And they're like, yeah, sure, whatever, kid. Not in my, not in my department. And when people are pushing back on something, then there is a good way, a good indication that the public really wants it. So yeah, the second, second leg of that is, is games and entertainment. And, you know, shout out to, what was it? BattleBots. That was a show. Shout out to BattleBots for pushing that entertainment of robotics into the public, into the public eye. Robotics, people had been doing nothing but sitting in their garages not really doing anything, but all of a sudden gaming and entertainment comes in and you've got battle bots. Now people are racing, you know, racing remote controlled vehicles across deserts, across highways. It's entertainment, right? You want to see a contest. So that's the second of the big three. And let's see, no one's guessed at the third big three in the comments here, but the third of the big three is the military, military applications. Your technology needs to see succeed with a military application. And that's basically, I'm going to go in there and kick someone's ass. So if you can't kick someone's ass, if you can't beat somebody, oh gosh, this is some more talk that might get me, that might get me blocked out. I'm not saying it like that, but I'm saying unless you have a military application, unless you have a, a way to force your will upon others, the technology might not be going anywhere. So no one, no one talks about this stuff, but this is what, what actually happens. You're going to have people looking into this technology. People were looking into text messaging when they were thinking of military applications. I know you've all seen the movies where some guy sends a text message to a phone and it sets off some, some event. This is the military application. This is where you start thinking of military uses of things. Right? Oh. I can use the radio towers and cellular technology to integrate this and that. That will allow me to force my will and push out control in this way. That'll be interesting. Oh, yeah, I'll do that. So how can we, basically, how can we gain power, enforce our will? I've always, I've always talked about power, and that's, to me, the definition of that is the ability to change the world in the way that you see fit. If you have power, you can change the world in the way that you see fit. And if somebody says no, and you say yes, you have more power if you can make that yes happen and they can't do anything about it. Or, you know, they're just going to get pushed out of the way or whatever. But they have more power if they can cause you to stop. Now, you may choose to stop just by influence or whatever. But if you have the actual ability to force your will upon this world and change it in the way that you see fit, you have power. So that's where mil the military side of things comes in at. Can you enforce your will upon others by using this? So given those three, where does this new Apple headset come in? I'm on 31. Hey, how's it going, man? Good. Thanks for stopping through again. Always showing love. So with the new VR mixed reality, I shouldn't say VR, with this new mixed reality Apple headset, where do the big three come in? Where do the big three come into play? Do you have the prawns? Sure, but they're never going to mention it. They're never going to say it. Maybe somebody will make some website that hooks in through HTML or VRML if you want to bring that back. 
Maybe somebody hooks into that construct. Apple will never say it, but that's a use for it. Being able to get your... I'm trying to be careful with my words here because AMP seems to be acting funny on people. But if you want to get your rocks off digitally, we, we, I think we, everybody can see the applications for that. Gaming. They really didn't mention gaming too much. The only thing they showed was flat gaming on, I mean, which is basically what you do in front of your TV. But maybe that's a good thing. Just regular old flat gaming because you're playing a, a video game and you're, you're in a shared house with the rest of your family or whatever. And people are like, hey, you're, you're hogging the TV or maybe even the TV makes it, it is putting out so much heat. It just warms the house and you don't want your whole house to be warm like that. That's actually a problem in some areas with global warming being a, a, an issue. Maybe you don't want your, your speakers and your, your big ass monitor kicking off all this heat. Maybe you just want to play in the comfort of your, your car or whatever on a big screen. Or you're taking a trip somewhere and you can't lug a big screen with you. So yeah, they use flat gaming as an application. That's not terribly exciting, but you got to think about what's, what's after that. 3D gaming, AR gaming, VR gaming. Where can you go with that? They didn't show any killer apps because Apple's never really been on the, the video gaming side of things. Apple's never really pushed that. So I don't know, maybe what, what type of games would you be thinking of? What types of game would you want to play on a system like this? What types of games or entertainment would you like to see? One thing that comes to mind, I worked at a company called Huawei. We were doing augmented reality tower defense. I mean, think about it. If you're, you're playing a tower defense game and you got an, you got a VR system and you're literally standing in a tower while people are approaching the tower. That's actually an interesting concept, being able to do a tower defense game from a VR tower. I don't know if there are games already like this on the MetaQuest. I really haven't looked into what they're up to. There probably is some sort of game out there like that. But now that Apple's bringing it to the forefront, maybe there's more of a talk for this. But there was no mention of really, of really utilizing entertainment and gaming for, for that next level. So we'll have to see about that. All right, I'm going to wrap this up soon and get down to some more music. But yeah, the gaming and military applications, those are, I, I, I don't want to talk too much about the military applications. You'll have to figure those out for yourself. And I figure if you're, if you're thinking along that direction, you may be either involved with the government or you're involved with some sort of firm that does this sort of thing. And it may not be necessarily military. It may be just security, right? You want to control certain things. Spying also comes into play with these types of things. So there are different applications. And second layer to the big three, you have industri industry and business applications. So here's one quick thing that you can do with, with mixed reality, right? Let's say you need to fix a car. Slap on these goggles and look, in your, look under the hood. Instead of seeing a bunch of wires, pipes, and machinery, the actual instructions from, from the product tell you, hey, listen, they're pointing an arrow in VR saying, hey, pull this thing, make sure that you don't rupture that, add, put this piston here or whatever. Don't put piston there. That's that whole bit. Plug this pipe in here or seal this off with some tape. Do this, touch that, reconnect these wires, replace this fuse, et cetera, et cetera. And you can just do that by looking at it. Like you look at something, it can start telling you what's wrong or what you might be experiencing and what you need to do. So this is, this is actually a very good business application and industry application. But that's, that's, if there were four, this is what I would say, industry applications. So those are the big three plus one. And this is, I want to get any, any questions or comments. I'll go back through the chat here, see if I missed anything. If you have any questions, comments, throw them in there and uh, we might want to, we might talk about them. Let me know. I do, I, I do enjoy this part of the thing. So I do really want to connect with you. So even if you don't have any questions now, be sure to come back later on the YouTube channel, maybe drop a comment, drop a, drop a note. Let me know that you're there and we'll keep this thing going. But for now, I want to know we're, we're getting into this computer era and I want to know who detached us from all this stuff. 
who sent us off into this direction? I want to keep this show at about an hour of talk, and then I'll scatter some music in there in between. So maybe it'll run about an hour and a half, two hours in total. We'll see how it goes. I wanted this to be a late afternoon or lunch type of thing. If you're, in the, if you're on the West Coast, it'll definitely be a lunch type of thing. I don't know. Let me know if you guys, where you're from, West Coast, East Coast, Midwest, down South, whatever. Let me know. I always want to hear where the people are, are tapping in from. So one other thing I, I had in my notes here that I wanted to talk about was just the idea of design coming from a corporate sense and coming from a human sense. I don't know how many of you know Tim Cook, but he is a very accomplished businessman and a very accomplished dedicated worker. I've got no shade for Tim Cook. I don't really know him like that, but as far as I know, stand-up dude doing his thing, he's definitely a, a hard ass in a lot of respects. I mean that in the best possible business way where you come in, do your thing, and you build upon that, and you don't compromise. So he was definitely a good person to keep the Apple Vision going. But what I don't sense from him, and this is you can't, it's so hard to fill the role of Steve Jobs. So I don't want anyone to actually try to do that. But you have to make a, you have to make a note that this whole vibe and in pushing into a new product, the first major product after the iPhone, and you're coming in with something that seems like it wants to push humanity, but it may be pushing us farther away from humanity. And with this type of technology and this type of push, I think one of the things that was missed from Steve Jobs, his legacy, is that he really was a humanist. If you look into his history, as abrasive as he was, as disconnected as he may have been from the, how do I put this? Not the lay person, but from the average person's set of emotions. I still believe he was thinking about the human experience and humankind. And yes, I know about his family issues. That's there too. But I want to focus in on his human aspect, right? And I've had a problem with this myself in my life where I get into computers and technology. I see I see my parents struggling with something. I'm like, hey, you know what? You could use this technology and it could do this, this, and this. And it gave me an opportunity to connect with them in a different way. And I remember I was really getting into uh, maps at one point. And my dad was like, hey, how do we get to, how do we get to such and such? How do we get to Bethany's house? We had to drop some food off at Bethany's house after church, right? This lady, Bethany. And I would break out the maps and I'm like, you know, we've never driven down this road. Apparently it connects behind under the bridge. If you go this way and down this road, I was just, it was a technological thing. And I was like, wow, human technology can connect with people in this way. And my dad was like, kid in the technology, go for it. You map out the new area. I got familiar with how AAA does its thing. Kind of goofy, but it was a way of connecting with people. And this is what Steve Jobs did. And that is what I think was missing from this discussion. I think a lot of the humanity was missing. For as much as we saw them talking about connecting, you notice they had people standing in these empty, perfect homes. I get the Apple vibe, but over time we've lost a bit of that humanity and now it just seems a little stale, a little, a little too antiseptic, right? We played Uptown Funk earlier. You need a little bit of funk in your technology. You, you need a little bit of that reality, human reality. When, when Steve Jobs was talking about the iPod Nano, I believe it was, he pulled it out of his, that, that little pocket that you have in your jeans. Not the, not the main pocket, but like the little pocket you have in the dinner. He found a use for that and made a little interesting point, made a joke and pulled that little interesting piece of technology out of that mini pocket, the iPod Nano. And the simple thing of having pulling things out of your pocket, or even back when he introduced the iMac, or yeah, the original Macintosh or whatever, to, 
to Warhol, Andy Warhol, the artist. He was like, hey, you can paint with this. You can actually sit down and paint and print it out so you can actually hold something in your hand. There was this connection that we don't get. Yeah, stay hungry, stay foolish, Cam. Shout out for that. And props to the people from East Coast. Got New Jersey, the West Coast up in here too. Very awesome. Got to remember to, you know what? It seems to be that AMP is very, very much based in like the, the Northeast and the Southwest. I don't mean, I should say SoCal. So we've got California and we've got New York, basically. I want to hear from more people outside the area. I wonder where, where everybody else is at. Maybe they're not, not as hip to AMP. Maybe AMP isn't advertising in those markets. I know I got hit with a bunch of AMP advertisements from Nick Cannon out here. So maybe they're geolocating and seeing if it hits in certain areas and markets first. Anyway. But creating on the aspect of, of humanity, I think that's where you start to get into a dystopian future where technology pushes us around instead of technology working in conjunction with us, where you see a, a utopian future as opposed to a dystopian one. I think back to the movie, what was that? Firefly. And what was another good, good movie that had a nice future? I suppose Star Trek is part of that too. And if you look back at the Star Trek ethos, it's definitely about having a good positive future. So yeah, I'm, I'm all for connecting with this technology and I'd be one of the people who, pushing developers to create things that connect people in better ways. I want to see more watch parties. I want to see more things that, that maybe aren't financially viable, but have us waste time just a little better. And when I say waste time a little better, I mean, those times when you used to sit around and BS with your friends in the college dorms, right? Those times when after you all went out to the movies, you guys just sat in the parking lot and ate, ate fast food for the next hour while you talked about the movie with your friends. And this is one of the reasons I like Amp, by the way, because you can sit back and like, hey, man, you remember that song we used to play? Boom. And just spark that song up. Hey, man, you remember that old beat from such and such? Oh, man, that song was garbage. No, man, pull, bring it up, bring it up. You can just play it right now. I remember we used to we used to bring, like, big albums of CDs into somebody else's dorm room or we'd bring it over to someone's house and we'd all have our CDs and this is how we'd share music. I'd bring out my, my No Limit songs and somebody else would bring out their, their Midwest songs. I got put on DJ Unique. I was like, who is this DJ Unique? It's like, dude, it's the producer for Bone Thug. And it's like, oh, okay. And we show each other stuff. Shout out to BJ Kolwinski. Putting me on Bone like that. I like Bone, but I didn't know Bone like he did. So, yeah, staying hungry, staying foolish. And staying connected to people and not just technology. So I said I had one last thing, and this is an Apple kind of thing that Steve Jobs started, where there's one last little point that he wanted to make. This is a show for artists, designers, developers. That's why I call my podcast the ADD Experience, and it stands for Art Design and Development. And I'm all about creating things and hopefully creating a better world while I'm here on this earth to do so. A lot of people are discussing whether it's going to fail, whether it's not going to fail, whether you like Apple, whether you don't like Apple. And I think a lesson that can be learned is you have a company, a culture, and a vibe that is about learning and growing and building. Maybe you want to include in that overcharging people, but whatever. Whatever you're doing, make sure you keep creating. Make sure you keep building. Make sure you keep adding. Make sure you keep designing. Make sure you keep developing. Because even if it succeeds, or even if, even if it fails, there are still things you can learn. And it might, and it really doesn't matter if it fails. I was about to say it might not matter if it fails. But for what they're doing, failure actually is an option. You can learn from your failures and you can build from them. With this new technology, almost every piece of it can be used in the future to advance other technologies. And that's what any good technology and any good creation should do. Even if it itself 
doesn't do what it intended to do, you should have learned something along the way. You should have progressed the discussion. A 12 camera array to view human motion can be used almost anywhere. A 3D spatial tracking headset can be, can be used almost anywhere. A way of attaching products to humans in a wearable form, a way of attaching technology, that's definitely going to be usable in the future and usable now. There are physically challenged people who would probably benefit from a lot of this technology that Apple's creating. So people asked back in the day why we were spending so much money on NASA and getting into outer space. All the technology that went into getting into outer space and building NASA was used to get America to the forefront. So don't knock people when they're really trying to do something big, crazy, audacious, and bold. Maybe support them. See what, see what you can find. Maybe, I mean, you don't have to like Apple. But maybe you say, you know what, Apple showed me this. I can do things a little better this way. I can learn from Steve Jobs. I can learn from Albert Einstein. I can learn from whoever. But just keep getting out there, creating, designing. And that's all I wanted to come back and say for this one. This has been Mr. Benja with Mr. Benja's ADD Experience Live, now on AMP for the moment. Be sure to follow along on YouTube or whatever podcast streams you can find me on. I'm going to keep doing this thing. Love you all. Appreciate your support. And I'll holler at you later.